and welcome to another wonderful interview with Constantly Cheeky. Up here we have Catherine Corelli, also known as Cat and Alice, for an interview uh, exclusive to us, and I'm very excited about it because, well, she's beautiful, but she's intelligent and absolutely talented, and I cannot wait for you guys to get to know her in this exchange. So welcome, Catherine. Um, do you want to give us a little feedback on who your band is and what your music is about? Hi, Constance. Uh, first of all, I want to express my extreme pleasure of being here and talking to you. <laughs> uh, um, responding to your question, well, actually, I don't have a band right now. It's like I'm, uh, I'm a solo artist. I'm looking forward to assembling a band and uh, considering my nowadays location I think that would happen um, after I move across the pond let's put it like this so it's like nowadays I'm kind of stuck around here in Moscow Russia and I'm like lost in limbo you know it's not like I'm not building anything around here because I'm I don't uh, I don't consider myself belonging to this place at all it's a, it's a long story but Breaking that down to very simple things, um, I don't identify as Russian. I identify as an American, and uh, so for obvious reasons, I'm looking forward to building a future and to building a future in my music career, uh, building that in the United States. So, right now, for now, <laughs> I'm a solo artist, and well, that's an interesting question about what is my music about because mostly I think it's about Kind of like I'm trying to. Well, everybody tries to express themselves artistically, right? Um, everybody reflects on their own experience, on their life experience, and um, I believe that the really good artists, or maybe the really good way to do art, is when you're able to take your own life experience, your personal, your very personal feelings, your very personal emotions, to generalize that. And to make it relevant, uh, to make it resonate to a lot of people. Right. So that's basically basically what I'm trying to do. And sometimes, and maybe mostly, I'm expressing myself through heavy metal, through <laughs> this kind of music, because it's well, it's something very very me, you know. But um, I have like 15 plus albums and EP on my website and uh, they're very different some of them are EDM music some of them are pure experimental you know uh, electronic um, some acid jazz you know too so and they kind of it's like some people write diaries and me I prefer to uh, summarize my experience and uh, deliver that through different genres, let's put it like this. And again, sometimes it might be something like the AC jazz kind of, kind of thing, like pop music maybe sometimes with with a pinch of country maybe, and sometimes and mostly probably like my main uh, my main genre, let's put it like this, is something heavy metal. It's beautiful. And. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I'm, definitely, I'm definitely trying to keep it beautiful. It's not always easy, you know, <laughs> considering that I'm a solo artist. But, well, uh, it's uh, it's something I'm all about. I mean, I can't, uh, I practically can't imagine my life without music. I can't, uh, I can't imagine any different, I can't imagine myself doing something different from this in life. Right. I am going to intercept here to tell you that when I went through your albums, <clears throat> you're right, you have a wide array of different kinds of music with the heavy influence of rock. Um, but that didn't matter to me because what mattered to me was I felt you in your music and I did feel more than able to be able to resonate with who you were, your joys and your pains. Um, your music was particularly beautiful to me. Like, you could see I'm tearing up. It's ridiculous. Like, I really loved, I have always loved people who will go against the grain and follow their own hearts 
trying to express something beautiful in the way that they see it and to share that beauty with other people <clears throat> and I feel like you know I'm the one who create these ads so I call you a medical metal core queen and the reason is is because you're leading a new genre of music and you're inspiring a million different people out there to find beauty maybe where people haven't always looked for beauty so we don't have to you know go always to the radio check her out on youtube one of my favorite things about Kat, Catherine corelli is that in your youtube videos you're talking you're like hold on and <laughs> i'm gonna talk to you while i'm doing this and let me do this that kind of engagement is so profound it's so different and it allows people to know you on a personal level and so i feel like you and i were friends before i even got to be your friend because i i felt like i knew you i knew that you were a beautiful woman and that you weren't doing this to meet somebody else's standards but you were creating your own and in that, I have been inspired by you, Catherine. It is amazing, and, and I applaud you for that. And I hope, America and world, that you take a moment out of your day to check her out on YouTube, and I'll include links down below, of course. Um, but check her out because she's leading a new genre in every way to include allowing you that one-on-one -on -one I am so sorry, Catherine. The world knows I own a rooster. He's kind of like backup sound. <laughs> but That's okay. yeah. back to the thing is that um, she's paving a whole new road. So if you're a young lady who's trying to express yourself musically and maybe you don't fit in with everybody else, check her out because she's showing you how to do it. And that's one of the things that inspires me about Catherine most specifically is that she shows you that bravery is sometimes found in the biggest hearts that that's so cool america and world his name's hey hey and he has this thing he doesn't rooster unless i'm interviewing so <laughs> i have a cat i have a cat and i've locked up my cat in the bathroom because she's in heat right now so uh, would I leave her somewhere around? She would be constantly viewing. And we would have this, we would have this uh, interview with a rooster on your end and a cat mewing on my end. Oh, <laughs> we should schedule it next time. So we we'll just invite them both in. I'll go outside and <laughs> hang out with the rooster. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Absolutely. next question: What inspired you to go after a music career specifically? Well, you know, I wouldn't say that it's a simple question. I mean, um, for me, uh, the reasons were pretty simple. But the story behind that is, isn't is short. There was quite a bunch of reasons. And, you know, in the first place, I probably wasn't supposed to do music. I was, as a kid, I was attending art school, um, you know, drawing doing that kind of thing but then later later it turned out that I got into music and well actually ever since I can remember myself I've I've been singing up to songs you know I've been doing that anyways uh, but because of the environment because of the very specific environment that I had in my childhood uh, things were it was let's say it was a very dark place it wasn't I I've never had a kind of happy apple pie kind of life. I had my childhood is a story of abuse and violence. It's a very dark place. So I guess <laughs> the reason why I'm saying that to me it's um, the reason why I went for music is so simple is because music was something very emotional something uh, through what I could channel myself, something where something that gave me focus, something that helped me um, find my own identity. I had issues with that and it took me a long while to figure myself out because I'm, uh, I happen to be a child of a narcissistic parent 
of an abusive father and um, a mother that actually was obviously a masochistic type of, had a masochistic type of personality, so it was hell, really. And um, it took me a long while to figure out things for myself. And music was exactly this thing that helped me focus, that helped me uh, like a sun road, you know. Right. That's something amazing. That led me, something that led me through. And on this way, it helped me process a lot of things. It helped me process, uh, process trauma and learn things about myself, dig up the real me, discover that, and uh, exactly learn to convert my own personal scars, all of those things, uh, to convert that into, into art. To share it with other people because I'm not the only one who suffered such things. There are a lot of people who, you know, there is a lot of crap happening, <laughs> happening out there, and some people uh, have worse circumstances, worse, worse life circumstances. I consider myself pretty lucky that I've been able to figure out things, and by now, I wouldn't say that I'm absolutely fine in my head, you know, everybody has something going on. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, Nonetheless, art is a very powerful tool. Uh, you can do a lot with that. You can go really far. And I just, I, I can't imagine myself not doing music. So the reason why I initially picked that, I think I was, I needed something, uh, something that would guide me out, something that would help me find a way in life. Even though everybody around was saying that it's an absolutely ridiculous decision to go to a musical school and start some kind of formal training and blah 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 everybody was against that everybody was telling me that I would <laughs> that, I, uh, that I don't have enough talent for it uh, that being a musician is something ridiculous and it's like practically like being a clown you know something like this and there was no support at all so everybody everything that I've achieved I've achieved despite not because right because i think of that there is a there is a good sense of value of this achievement that i've been able to push forward i've been able to go no matter what who says what you still push you still go and you still do it see i think you and i have a lot in common and i don't ever talk about my childhood for very similar reasons um your music, one of the reasons I teared up is because I, I was able to connect to that, that childish hurt, that child life hurt. Um, and I saw it in you and I saw the healing and the progression listening through all of your albums, which I liked every single one of them. There's not a problem with any of them for me. Um, but I agree with you. I think that as a little girl, if you didn't grow up with loving parents, um, or a loving situation, your life can go many different ways. But it's always rare when you find that girl that goes, I'm going to take your nose and throw them. And I'm that girl, and I love being that girl, and maybe not everybody understands me or you when we hear the nose and the negativities and we keep doing what we want to do. Um, but I applaud you for that, and I love that you said that because I think that there is a million young girls out there who, and boys, I'm not against, you know, everybody, but they can hear that no doesn't have to actually mean no, it just means that that person is not believing in you. Find somebody who does. Because in Catherine's case, she found lots of people who told her no and that she wasn't talented, but here I'm doing an interview with her professionally, and I'm telling you that she's talented and to check her out. So I'm very glad that you continue to push through that, Catherine. <clears throat> I'm glad that you were able to share that with the world, Catherine, because um, I was never told it was okay to push past no. It was something I had to learn through time, which is what I think you're saying too. And it's that, that point of discovering yourself. And I'm in my 30s and I felt like I didn't know what it was to be an adult woman and confident in one's own decision until I decided that I wasn't listening to anybody but, <clears throat> but myself. 
And now that I listen to myself, the people who love me and support me have started showing up all around me. And I hope that's true for you. And I cannot wait for you to get to America because we need to do coffee. Um. <laughs> oh, yes. Coffee and donuts. Oh, yay. <laughs> donuts. Yeah, donuts. Um, okay, so let's get to the next question because we'll keep America here forever. This lady is so cool. Um, <laughs> what goals did you set for yourself your first year as a musician? Oh, that's a very good question. I mean, looking back, you know, in retrospect, I think when I just got started, which was quite a long, a long time ago, um, I think I practically, I didn't have any really big goals or something like a clear, a clear understanding of where am I going with that. What I knew basically is that I am learning because I went to musical school and for the first four years I've been there and I've been trying to figure out what what am I about, what do I like to do in music because I've been, uh, I've had some uh, piano training and I've been exposed to classical music but it kind of didn't really, you know, resonate a lot to me uh, because earlier in life, before that, uh, in my childhood, I've been exposed to rock music and uh, black music, to blues, to to that old school blues, you know. Yeah. And it was something about that I uh, I like to just you know instead of playing Beethoven or something like that, I like to just you know pick a classroom, an empty classroom, pick a piano, and just sit and improvise, just play. And I liked it a lot, you know, listening to the sound of the piano, listening to, to just how it flows. And I didn't really care about the technique. I remember I had a problem with the teachers because the teachers were telling me, don't swing Beethoven, but I couldn't play Beethoven straight because to me it sounded like, well, this is just ridiculous. How can you play this over and over and over again? And, well, it just doesn't appeal really. Doesn't rock, you know. <laughs> wrong about it, you know. I wanted to give it. I wanted to give it some. I was like, I thought to myself that would Beethoven himself sit somewhere around. This dude, who would, he would swing with me, and he would enjoy that, you know, and he would laugh with me because that is his piece. That that guy is dead already. But I think if he would be somewhere around now, uh, he would play his music, those pieces. Uh, that everybody knows nowadays they're, you know, considered classic. Yeah. I think he would play that in some, in some wiggling manner and <laughs> have absolutely no problem, you know, swinging that, maybe, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. And so I had this kind of approach, and the teachers were like, they were very, you know, they were so very classical, they were so very, uh, they had this, those presets in their minds like you should do this and you should do that and you can't play that with this finger and you can't do this you can't play an extra note there just no way and I was like well why can't I play an extra note well really because <laughs> why am I supposed to play like somebody else this is okay I get it somebody wrote this piece but I'm like I'm offering my interpretation of this and uh, this is probably interesting you know when a musician interprets another piece their way and gives it new life. This yes. is what music is alive. This kind of thing. And I couldn't really word it back, back then, but I kind of felt it that that's the right thing to do. At the same time, I had, you know, some... Uh, first, I thought that I'm going uh, that I'm going to go for the music theory department to that thing, so I've been heavily trained on music theory, really heavily. Like, you know. Um, but... It didn't turn out that way. I mean, I just practically because of the, because of a silly coincidence uh, when I was supposed to get before the exam uh, to get to that professor and show what am I supposed to play on piano. I had it. Uh, I had my my finger, my middle finger, got uh, scarred, and I had a huge bondage here. So I came there, the professor watched me, and he asked me, what are you going to play? And I was like, well, I was, I was going to play that thing, this piece. And, oh, it was the left hand. And he 
asked me, well, uh, as far as I remember, that piece is mostly about the left hand. And she's like looking at my <laughs> middle finger and I'm like, uh, well, uh, I'm not sure I should try, really. Maybe not this time, you know. And he was like, yeah, I don't think it's a good idea. How about you check in next time? <laughs> and then I just walked out, walked out and, you know, uh, thought to myself, well, you know what? I don't really want to go for music theory, so no, I'm not going to that college this year. And so eventually it just turned out that I continued my musical education as a uh, singer. Yeah, the uh, hands-on approach. Yeah, and mostly, it, but nonetheless, there is the Russian educational system, and it's something absolutely different, I believe, from anything, from how things are in the Western world. So practically, I was, again, I was going against the grain, and I was doing, like, you know, on an exam, on the final exam, after five years of college, I was performing Slipknot. <laughs> my plague, my plague, the, the song that was featured as the title track on Resident Evil movie. Yes. I was performing My Blake by Slipknot, and everybody was shocked. And it was the first day of the exam, and the director didn't want to allow me for the, for the next exams because he took that as personal offense. He was like, well, how can you do that? Everybody's singing songs. And <laughs> well, dude, hell knows what they're on stage, you know. I love Slipknot. <laughs> yeah, but nonetheless, you know, you know, actually, the audience, I mean, the students, actually, everybody enjoyed that, you know. Good. I, I put up a hell of a show there, but the, the teachers and the director, they were absolutely against that, and they were like, oh, you should, you should tell us what lyrics exactly did you sing there, because we spotted some, uh, that this is, you know, personal offense, because they were swearing words, and, you know, this kind of thing. <sighs> like, oh my god. Guys, they have nothing else to do, you know, really, to discuss this. Seriously. I went to art schools, too, growing up, and I had the same problem. The thing is, is it's so funny because I think that if you're artistic, it's natural for you to want to incorporate your own vision into everything. And... Oh, maybe one day we should open up an art school where we actually allow the students to do what they want. Because here in the West, you end up with the same problem. Um, let me see. We're going to have to skip through some of these questions. You're just too much fun. Um, well, uh, just, 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 to, uh, uh, sorry, just to round out that question about the goals. You know, I think the goals actually just came in the process, like through years of doing this. The further I got, the more obvious to me became, uh, what am I going for? What uh, did I sign up for at the same time? You know, what do I really want? Right. So nowadays for me, it's either I'm going for everything or I'm just not able to go for anything. I mean, I need to go for all. It's right. like a do or die thing. Go big or go home. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, what is the largest obstacle as an artist that you've had to overcome? Oh, you know, it's hard to tell. No, I think it's not as hard to tell. There is like one thing was, uh, I've actually told you already about that, you know, people when your parents and your family, so-called family, they, they tell you, they, they discourage you on a daily basis. They tell you that you will never make it and they want you to do something absolutely different and you don't want to do that. That's one thing. Okay, you get through that, you gain some personal confidence, you, uh, you get to know people, you know, you have buddies, you have friends and you kind of, it helps you to build up something. You go with that. So. In retrospect, you realize that's, that this is not the biggest problem, really. Right. I think the biggest challenge that happened to me uh, in these past 10 years was uh, loss of my voice. It happened in 2013. I was uh, undergoing two surgeries at a time, and the surgeon that operated on my throat, I was having a Adam's apple shave here. He messed up my recurrent nerve. Oh. If you 
you know, the recurrent nerve is the nerve that controls the muscles that actually uh, work with the vocal cords. Right. So it's practically like if you sever it too bad, you might not be able to not only to speak, but also to yawn, to move your lower jaw, those things, because this nerve controls all of this area, including the vocal cords. And this surgeon made, excuse me, a piece poor excuse for a job, really. He messed it up badly. And on top of everything, because that, that, was, that was a big, large story, and it was really bad, uh, after that, he left me with no professional supervision. It was impossible. So I was forced to figure out things on myself. For the first month, I thought that those are the consequences of the intubation, like my voice is hoarse, but actually there was no voice at all. I mean, I was uh, barely whispering something, you know, a very crunchy kind of whisper. And uh, I couldn't feel my throat at all here, starting from the chin and down all the way here to, to my collarbones. And then the second month, the third month, and the fourth month, and nothing came back. And I was trying to produce sounds. I was trying, I was Googling up a lot of things. I figured that that's the recurrent nerve, that it's not the intubation, that it's something really bad. I read a ton of medical literature. I'm, I'm not educated in this area, but I've educated myself. I've looked out, you know, for other people. Um, with a thing like this, and um, unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of help because it's kind of well, it's a very subtle thing, and unless you're a specialist, it's damn hard to figure it out what exactly and how does it work. And the nerve tissue itself is a very complicated thing, it doesn't rebuild, it doesn't grow. It's like you can scar your finger, for instance, and it will grow together, right? Right, or a broken bone will grow together or any other tissue in the human body will grow together, but the nerve tissue never grows together. The severed part dies. Yes. And, and then you need to grow a new branch of nerves to get to those muscles that were disabled. And until you do that, those muscles won't get the signal from your brain. And this is just insanely hard to make this happen. But it's possible. So it's a tremendous job about, you know, convincing yourself that you can do that, do that. And living with the fact, like, you know, three doctors told me that you will never, that you will never sing, that you can change your occupation and forget about this. It was really hard to hear this from, from doctors. Right. And to, and to continue, you know, being like, well, you know, <laughs> actually I told all three doctors, I told them to stick it where the sun doesn't shine. <laughs> good good for you yeah all right guys we're back we took a quick little break for girl time because we're awesome people and we like chatting with each other um Catherine, i want to ask you one more question maybe i'll give you three questions and let you pick the answer that you want to run with and then i'm gonna beg you to do a follow-up with me because i think we had like seven questions that went unanswered <laughs> Um, so okay. how about we do the three questions and you get to pick the one that means the most to you and we'll run with that. So okay, you could, maybe I'll just, okay, okay. Do you want to do that or do you want to just wrap up the way you want? No, I think I can actually run, I remember the questions of what are they approximately about so I can run through each one of them real go, quick. Go ahead. That would be amazing. Yeah yeah. 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 So let's go through the questions. Okay. So... If you could share a glimmer of advice for an upcoming band, what would you say? Well, I think it would be uh, very simple. Uh, the number one thing that I would recommend to everybody who is looking into a career in music, uh, determination, passion. Those two things are very important. It's not going to be an easy ride. There are no easy ways in this industry, never. Uh, it's going to be hard work. You might be more talented, you might be less talented. But in the end, it boils down to your ability to stay focused, to work hard, to have enough passion to work hard. Otherwise, you will never make it. Because 
if you think that he will just suddenly overnight become famous and a superstar and uh, he will just dwell on that, it won't happen. Because when he will become a superstar, if that happens, which is part one, part two will be working your ass off right there and sustaining the status of a superstar. Is it worth it? I think it's absolutely worth it if you have the passion for it, if you really love what you do. That's, that would be my advice. That's amazing advice, and I agree with that advice completely. Um, what is the most, most valuable social media platform for artists, in your opinion? In my opinion, I wouldn't say that there is uh, that there are social media platforms that are not valuable. Practically, they are all valuable. Uh, what's important to understand is that they become valuable when you really look into what tools they provide, what options they provide, and you use those tools. If you don't use them properly, any social uh, social platform will look like absolute nonsense, and you won't make a lot of sense out of that. It won't do the job instead of you. There is, uh, there is Facebook, there is Google+, Plus, there is Instagram, there is Twitter, and they're all different. They, uh, the, the things they are, uh, the things they em- uh, emphasize. emphasize. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, um, the tools they provide are different. The algorithm they run on is different. Instagram is mostly visual. Facebook is a lot of things at once in a bunch. Then there is WhatsApp, and then there is Twitter, and it's about different things. And then there is Pinterest, and it's a whole other story. Right. So I think it mostly depends on uh, what on your strategies, on how do you promote yourself, and what suits you well, what what runs best with you. That would be the right the right choice. Maybe I believe that it would be important to to run profiles on several social networks so that you can kind of stay flexible in your strategies and use different approaches and figure out the best possible solution. Uh, solutions in a, in a complex strategy. I think that's a great answer. So, um, summarize, use what works for you and what you're going to be able to incorporate into your strategy in a winning fashion. Yeah? Yes, I would say, yes, exactly. I would say that this question is a long one, and uh, I would like to talk about this maybe on a follow-up. Uh, what I... Uh, what I've learned about social media and uh, I might share you know, some opinions that I've heard from different people um, because there's music industries, one thing and then there are other industries and the approaches in those different industries are different and right. um, a combo uh, a combo of you know, a few features from this and that and blah blah blah, those things uh, they somebody might use them really really well to their advantage. I would love to do a follow-up with social media because Rupert and I like to focus on that. Um, hmm, what is the relation to literature and music for you? I remember this question. Well, first of all, I'd say that uh, I wouldn't say that there is a lot of relation between literature and uh, literature and music. For me personally, but there was a significant relationship between literature and, and myself when I've been a little kid, because the very first character from uh, from from a book that we all know, Alice in Wonderland, was the character that helped me figure out things and stay sane, stay stay me, find myself uh, walking through through darkness. I love Dallas too. Yes, uh, further in life, I think I got, I mostly get inspired and I mostly feel a relation between. I mean, not exactly literature and music. To me, it's rather about cinema and music. I'm a I'm a great fan of David Lynch. I love I love him a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I also uh, I'm a fan of the Resident Evil movies with Miljovic. Me too. Uh, the character Alice. Yes, yes, that resonates largely to me. Yeah, such films. Um, 
Um, nowadays, by the way, I'm looking, I'm, I'm watching the new Twin Peaks, and I'm absolutely fascinated by Lynch's work. That's huge. Really? Yes. I recommend everybody to look into that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I've, uh, as a kid, I've been read a lot of books. I'm very familiar with Mark Twain, with Charles Dickens, with, uh, with some French writers, too. Um, I've been exposed to religious literature, but that didn't really, you know, didn't really sit. <laughs> um, and poetry, a lot of poetry. And my, probably one of my most favorite poets, it might sound a little ridiculous, is Alan Milne. Ooh. The Alan Milne that wrote Winnie the Pooh. I, I absolutely adore his poetry because it's extremely simple and it's absolutely genius because how can you say something is simple? How can you put so much emotion and feeling into just very simple lines? This is absolutely fascinating. You know, I'm well familiar with Shakespeare. Yes. Being there as a little kid, my brain was stashed with William Shakespeare. I mean, that hardcore... Uh, old English. It's horrible, really. Did your dad read it to you? Because my dad used to read me all of the yes. same books you're listing. Yes. Okay. Yes, my dad. My dad was reading to me. Yeah, I still remember. Uh, I still remember a few lines from Shakespeare. But Alan Milne, you know, this is something absolutely fabulous. So, if there is some kind of relationship between me uh, and literature, I think I would give credit to Mark Twain in the first place because Mark Twain, with his subtle sense of humor this is something that really helped me throughout my life this is something that uh shines in my own music i mean i like uh approaching these a little you know taking my experience and putting them delivering them in a slightly ironic manner maybe you know kind of you know uh, taking a step aside and laughing at myself you know sometimes and laughing at other things and taking things positively instead of you know like when something bad happens you crack a joke Yes. And you, you laugh at that, you know, because that's the best, well, the best way to deal with that. And thanks to Mark Twain for this, really. <laughs> so there is my relationship with literature, cinema, and music. That's how it is. That's amazing. I hope I answered the question. I'm going to leave the social media questions for a follow-up video. I know that you have a lot going on and a big announcement coming up for tomorrow. Don't you have a release? I have a release, yeah, but no... Uh, it still says Eastern Time, it's uh, July 12th, to be more precise, on July 14th, in less than two days. I'll have my prim uh, primary website release of my new album called I, Alice, Severance. Um, it's a metalcore, hardcore, new metal album with death metal influences. <laughs> and I'm going to release that on, uh, on my new website. I'm moving to a new platform, and I'm going to uh, to have a neat, new, clean, fast-running website. I like it already. Uh, so my, my album will be released there in the first place. And uh, later on, it depends on how fast TuneCore will process my request. Uh, this album will also hit all major outlets like Amazon and iTunes and Spotify and everywhere else. That's how it's going to be. That's so exciting. Do you know what your new web address will be? <clears throat> uh, yeah, it's going to be catcarelli.com. Catcarelli.com. I will put a link down below. Um, you guys, yes. all of this is happening on the 14th here in the United States. So you will have to check out catcarelli.com online first thing. Um, Kat, thank you so, so much for this interview. I... <sighs> I will always remember this. Just every time we have talked, it has it has truly been so inspirational and motivational personally, um, beyond professionally. I cannot wait to watch you climb the ranks in the music industry. And as soon as you're here in the U.S., yell at me because I want to be front row at one of your concerts. I will rock out with you. That's so exciting. Um, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. You are thank so welcome. Thank you, honey. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy we've talked. Me too. And whenever you're up to making a follow-up, just, you know, call me. I'll come. Awesome. I will. You guys, all of her links are down below. Please be sure to like and share as well as follow her because 
What is this? This is going to be album number 15. I think it's going to be album number 16, but actually I see it as, uh, you know, a fresh start. Because okay. everything that I've done before, this is the first album that I'm going to release after my uh, voice loss in 2013. This is the first album with brand new, fresh music, with my new voice, with my new approach, the new me, the new everything. So this is going to be something... It's not... It, it doesn't feel like it's going to be the 16th album. It feels like it's going to be like the first album ever, you know, in a sense. sense. Alright, you guys. Check out Alice Severin's Kat Corelli's first official new album to a brand new start to success but also pay very close attention to what she said because you guys she's been doing this for a very long time and she took time out of her day to share with you her experience and her lessons as an artist so learn from them so you can grow and continue to prosper in your own endeavors thank you so much Catherine Corelli I hope you have a beautiful night thank you it's morning here but I think it will be very beautiful. <laughs> Sorry, Thank morning. You so very much. Bye, yeah. American yeah. world.